which is in Western Massachusetts. So when I became Muslim, it was, it was somewhat in isolation. There wasn't a, the closest mosque was nearly an hour away. And the reason I became Muslim, um, we have to go back to my childhood. So I was raised in a Presbyterian uh, church, but we were, you know, like the, the Christmas, Easter Christians. We didn't really go on a too regular of a basis. And I was always very, um, very scientifically oriented. So I have my degrees in engineering from the University of Michigan. I'm very, I used to be a math teacher as well. Uh, so was like everything was about math and science for me growing up. And my older sister became atheist, and she kind of introduced me to this idea of you got to choose science or religion. And so I, I chose science because when I studied religion, it just it seemed like a lot of mythologies to me and um, a lot of things that didn't make sense in a history that was. Uh, not the not the greatest history of the church, and so I became an atheist uh, at a very young age, probably of 11, 12 years old, um, and that's the way I was until I got to high school. We moved from New Jersey, Massachusetts. We moved next to a family who had a son my age. His name was Mike Dan. Um, Mike and I were very different. He used to have a lot of problems with alcohol and drugs, so we never interacted too much until he became Muslim, and he became Muslim through the influence of a black tennis coach of his that was Muslim, um, and who really spoke to him about, uh, I think, the oneness of God in Islam, and that really appealed to him, and, and uh, eventually he became Muslim when he's like, I think, 15, and his whole, whole life changed, so he stopped doing drugs and drinking, he started taking, uh, you know, advanced classes in, in school, and so I'd walk in, and I'd be like, Mike, what are you doing in this class, you know, like, he lost, and he's like, no, I'm taking class, and so I got to learn slowly from him about Islam, and it made a lot of sense to me that if Jesus, if Moses could be a prophet and Jesus could be the prophet, then why couldn't this other man named Muhammad be a prophet? Peace be upon them all. And um, but I was atheist; I didn't believe in God. So to me, it was all just a, a, the, a theoretical kind of uh, exercise. Until I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and when I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. He really touched me, his words really touched me, and he said that if you take one step towards God, God will take two steps towards you. And I was a scientist, and so it's a hypothesis, so the only thing I can do is test the hypothesis. And so I stopped eating pork and going to parties with alcohol with the intention that if this is a true religion and if God really exists, that God guide me to him. And I continued to study Islam, and what I found was the more I studied Islam, the more I was silenced. So I would ask questions, even like questions I used to ask about Christianity. So I used to ask, who was Jesus? And I realized that we really couldn't, didn't know too much about who Jesus really was. And I asked the same question about who was Muhammad? And all of a sudden, you, you, there's all this information about who he is. And when you study his life, he was clearly a sincere man. He was clearly uh, motivated to to spread the message of, of the oneness of God and help the poor and disenfranchised people. And he wasn't in it for power, he wasn't in it for money, so you, you start to ask yourself, what, what was he doing? And I asked the same question about the holy book. So when I looked in the Bible, how do we know that this is an authentic book from God? You start find, or I would find, you know, contradictions in the book and different versions of the Bible. And when I asked the same question about the Quran, I found that there's only, and has only always been one Arabic Quran which just no matter what your sect is, what period of history you're in, or where in the world you are, it's the same Quran. Um, and that even people who aren't Muslim acknowledge that it came from the time period of the Prophet Muhammad. They just don't think God, he think, they think he wrote it, that God didn't write it. Um, and I kept asking those questions and kept getting silence as I tried to prove Islam away until I got to uh, a point where I thought, uh, I was reading about the afterlife. And I thought, you know, this is time in high school when you're preparing for college and the SATs and all those things. And I was thinking about, I spend so much time preparing for those matters in my life that are probable but not certain. And there's one matter in my life that's certain that I've never even thought about. And that's the matter of what happens to me when I die. Um, and so at that point I was like, either there is no God or it's Islam. And I didn't really want to take my chances, so I became Muslim. And um, it's been quite the journey since then, because I told you it was uh, three months before 
And and I had I mean I didn't know what a Sunni or Shia was. People are like ask me like, oh, are you Sunni or Shia? I'm like, I'm Muslim. Like I don't know. And and um, at a very good, we we Mike and I became Muslim in a vacuum. So like you know what we learned was what we we could read or learn from like one or two people. There was no mosque, nothing, nothing around us. Um, so I made a lot of mistakes early on, uh, but I was very fortunate to come here to University of Michigan for college, and I had a great five years there. Uh, it's a really fantastic Muslim community in Michigan that you're probably aware of. Um, all sorts of diversity, African American and Arabic, and uh, or Arab and, and uh, Indo-Pakistani. Um, and I left, and I went back to Massachusetts for a couple of years as a teacher, and worked out there, and then I decided I missed Michigan too much, so I recently, I moved back to a little bit, uh, a little more than two years ago, and I live in Detroit, and uh, I love to, you know, just work with community, do what I can to help people. Are we gonna do questions at the end? Oh, we do at the end. Okay, all right. Well, assalamu alaikum. All right, that was a test. <laughs> <laughs> so, assalamu alaikum is the greeting that Muslims greet each other and friends with, and assalamu alaikum means peace be unto you. And there is a response, which is, Mom? Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Can you guess what that means? And also, and also peace to you. Right? So we're going to do it again. So, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Beautiful. All right. So, my name is Irina Iman Alameen Naim. And I was born with most of that name. So my life as a Muslim growing up in America has been filled with respect, but also a lot of inquisition. And my name automatically opens me uh, for questions and uh, inquiry. And my name was chosen by my mother. So names when babies are born, they, people choose names for them to guide their life and also for people to kind of know something about this child. So my name, Zarina, means of gold and beautiful. Iman means faith in Arabic. Elamin means trustworthy. And Naim is my married name, and it means joy. So I have a lot to look up to and live forward to. And it's also a nursery rhyme. So <laughs> people often tell me that. Your name is really long, and it rhymes. So um, I think what I wanted to share with you all today about my life as a Muslim in America um, and as an African-American Muslim in America is that um, I think African-Americans in particular are in a unique position um, in the country. My parents, as many of you heard earlier from the beginning, um, converted to Islam separately. So my mother converted, my father converted, they met at the masjid, they got married, and then they had children, and we were raised Muslim after that. So, um, we were raised Muslim after that. But as any child you know, grows up, you're taught certain beliefs, but you have to consciously make a decision for yourself in a moment. Like you cannot stay in that, that place where your parents are telling you, this is what you believe, this is what you do, this, these are the habits that you have. And I think for me, um, there were times when I oscillated in life. So there were times when I was more of a practicing Muslim than other times. And I think cemented like within my heart, I would say um, really around like college age was when for me it was like, like this is who I am, this is a part, it's not just because my mother converted and my father converted, but this is something that is a part of Zarina's life and I believe it's truth, and I'm going to live it. So for me, that meant that um, following you know, the five pillars of Islam, does anyone know what the five pillars of Islam are? No? Yes, OK. So go ahead and tell her. She looks like she should be a teller. How do I know? Because <laughs> she looks like a Muslim, so I'm going to guess. <laughs> so what's a pillar of Islam? Um, the Shahada, which is the uh, declaration of your faith. Salah, which is prayer, your five daily prayers. Um, there's Saum, which is fasting, where we're coming up on Ramadan, where we fast 30 days. Uh, there's Zakah, which is charity, given um, from your wealth to help feed the poor. And Hajj, which is pilgrimage to Mecca. Right. 
So those are the five basic things that we're all supposed to do as Muslims. And it sounds like it's not a lot, but for me at that moment, it was a lot. Like for me to consciously make a decision to wake up in the morning, early morning. Like right now, our early morning prayer is at 4, 20, 4, 30 in the morning. That's early, right? So you're waking up out of your sleep at 4, 30 in the morning to pray to your Lord and to ask for forgiveness and to ask for guidance. And although you are benefiting from it, it's still a struggle. It's still a struggle for me <laughs> to get up early in the morning and make that conscious decision. So um, I made this, the, the determination that in my life, this was something that I needed to do for me. And I went to college um, at Howard University in Washington, DC. Lovely place. I miss it a lot <laughs> in many ways. And I studied computer science there. And for the first couple of years when I was at Howard, um, many of my friends knew that I was Muslim by name, of course, but then also from asking me, are you coming to this party? Do you want to go drink? No, I don't drink. Do you smoke? No, I don't smoke. Why? Oh, Muslim. You know, so you get that in college. And college is a time for many people to um, explore and to kind of seek out different things, to test different things in life. and. Um, I had a lot of people that, that questioned me a lot about some of the choices that I made and some of the things that I did and did not do when I was in college. Um, towards the end of my college, I decided that I was going to go into the Peace Corps. And that was a big thing for me in life. Um, I always wanted to do that, but I got rejected. <laughs> I got rejected because I didn't have my wisdom teeth. So I passed all the things, but if you don't have your wisdom teeth, they can weed you out so that um, if you're in the field and you happen to have your teeth cut in and it's very, very painful, they don't want to have to medevac you out. So that was an issue. So I didn't go to the Peace Corps, but I decided to go to Egypt instead. And I think this was, I graduated in 2001. Um, and I had originally planned to go to Morocco. And then this thing called 9-11 happened. And all my program in Morocco was immediately canceled. Mm -hmm. So I decided I was going to go anyway, and I went to Egypt. And everybody was thinking that I was crazy. <laughs> like, why are you going to a Muslim country um, after 9-11? You don't know what you're doing. You know, aren't you scared? So I got a lot of questions like that from Muslims as well as non-Muslims. Um, and I went to Egypt, and I stayed there for about 11 months. Um, and I studied Arabic and I kind of went back and forth uh, as well. I taught English to Sudanese refugees. That was a whole other experience. And then I taught English to uh, middle and upper class, I hate the word class, but higher income um, Egyptians as well. And being an African American Muslim in a Muslim country was a totally different experience just as far as Islam goes as well because um, Many people didn't assume that America had a lot of Muslims, let alone people that looked like me that were Muslim. So that was a question. Um, so speeding up, I came back to the United States, and then I um, began working in another Muslim part of the world, which was West Africa. And so I worked in Sierra Leone and Senegal um, in international development there. And being in that Muslim environment was a total contrast to being in the Muslim environment in Egypt. They were two totally different types of places, although they are both parts of the Muslim world. Um, I think I was, I won't say necessarily accepted more, but I was more normal <laughs> in Sierra Leone, and you can imagine probably why. So. <laughs> um, and then after that, I uh, moved to Kalamazoo. And in Kalamazoo, I became a diversity consultant. I studied anthropology. And I did several talks on Islam um, and Muslim experience throughout the Kalamazoo region, and also talks on racial healing and communication and connectivity amongst us as well. So that is a big part of my life in trying to explain um, those things. And um, within talking about race, although Islam is not a race, and race is a social construct as we know anyway, many people have racialized Islam. And so now when speaking about Islam and Muslims, um, when we're talking about race, Islam comes up nearly in every conversation. And I was talking to these two, uh, this couple from Washington County, because now I'm in Ann Arbor doing discussions around race and racial healing 
through the Museum of Natural History in Ann Arbor, and nearly every conversation, someone is asking about, well, what about those uh, Muslims? <laughs> I said, well, it's Muslim. Well, what about them? You know, what about the Arabic? Oh, they're Arab. You know, so we have a lot of questions and a lot of things going on. And I think for me um, here today, I hope that my goal, my goal in being here and why I accepted to come is just to kind of hear your questions and hope that we can have a dialogue um, and an opening of the gates, if you will. So I hope that's enough. Thank you. Hi, everybody. How are you this afternoon? Great. My name is uh, Tamam Alwan. <laughs> And I'll start by telling a little bit about myself as well, starting with my parents. Um, and maybe I was thinking of going a little bit further back, my grandparents, and then I was thinking of my great-grandparents, and then I was thinking of my great-grandparents, great-great-grandmother, <laughs> who was the first one who actually came here to the U.S. She came in the beginning of the 20th century, before World War I. Uh, her name was Malika, and she came with her two sons, Mus uh, uh, with Wasfi and Faris. Faris, my great-grandfather. And so they came over here and they actually settled down in Cleveland and then went to Detroit. We still have pictures of uh, an ice cream shop that they had opened up. Uh, it's black and white in a car that my great-grandfather's brother had bought. And then after World War I, they decided to actually go back except for one of the brothers. He actually stayed here. He got married to a lady, a local lady. I think she was from Cleveland. I don't remember her name. And, the, and we even still have letters where they're going back and forth. So the history kind of starts back there, but then they went back to Syria, which is where my family comes from. Although my great-great-grandmother is from what's now Lebanon, because, you know, it was just one province from before. Um, after that, my grandfather, you know, he has this history. His father went there, and his grandmother went there. And so he also comes to America and becomes an American citizen and settles down. He, he spends a lot of time with us here in Michigan and also in California. But then he ends up going back to Syria as well in, Dama in Damascus. And my dad, in uh, 1976, after finishing medical school at Damascus University, wants to specialize and he wants to do his residency. So he applies and he becomes accepted. And so he comes here first to Chicago and then to Detroit, where he ends up specializing in ENT, ear, nose, and throat, and in allergies. And it's allergy season for a lot of us, for me, year round. And so uh, we, we end up settling down in, in Waterford, which is where I was born. And uh, we went to an Islamic school. And I'm, I'm mentioning the education. I want, I want you to pay attention to that because that plays a very important role in my life and in this discussion as well. Because we're, we're, you know, after all, coming here to learn. We're coming here as people of different backgrounds in order to learn about each other and to think about what sort of processes go through when we... When we learn about these things, when we analyze new information. Uh, and seeking knowledge is, is something that uh, I think brought my family first here to America and also brought them back because they wanted to settle down with family and learn more about that culture and go through the reverse culture shock again, which I myself experienced. And that's what brought my father here. And that's what made us settle down in Waterford because we were, we were pretty close to a, a private school in Franklin called Huda School. And when my brother reached 8th uh, grade, and that was the limit, my dad said, well, what are we going to do? Because this Islamic school, this private school, and I'm very happy with its quality, but that's it. Where are we going to move? And so he says, so he starts searching. And keep in mind that my dad works, and he still works in Flint and Detroit. So that's a big commute. It's a really long commute. And on top of that, he's epileptic. So he's not able to drive. And so our, our family situation is that my mom... You know, may, may God bless her, super mom. I mean, all our moms are super moms, really, because they, they, they all totally go out of their way. She's driving back and forth and taking us to this private school just because he's really concerned about his children's education. And so he says, well, there are these schools in Bloomfield Hills, and they're really good quality schools. So we actually moved here for one reason, and one reason only, the school system, because my dad was that concerned about education. And so... I started attending Lone Pine Elementary School, fifth grade, and then West Hills Middle School, Andover High School. And this kind of stayed in the back of my mind, but it didn't really come out in, until I went to MSU and I started to study and I started to look at different things of how can I really have an impact on society? And I was thinking, well, maybe medicine, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, take, uh, I'll do what my father did and I'll help people. But then I was thinking, well, that's so limited. 
So maybe business, that's something that could be even, even more beneficial because I could maybe help in buying hospitals and, and spending money in that way. And you know, we even see companies, corporations like McDonald's and Coca-Cola, and they spend so much to help people at the same time. It's not just the business. But then it hit me that really the, the thing that we need in this time and age when we're past these empires and past looking at you know, all of the, the steel that a country has is really the mind. And, and thought and education. And so I, after studying um, Arabic, I studied Arabic there, I have a bachelor's in Arabic and also in interdisciplinary humanities, studying history and religious studies and Arabic language and culture and doing a Muslim studies specialization in the James Madison College of Public Policy. I decided that I really wanted my role to be in education and I wanted to be a college professor. And so I started to travel with some programs. I went to Egypt in 2009. Uh, for eight months, and I went to Syria, Damascus for four months. I even went to Turkey for five months, Istanbul, to study Turkish and teach English over there. Um, until I realized that I really, and I, I'm not saying this to put anybody down here because we're all adults here, but I could, I could invest the most in educating the young and spending time with, with children. Because that's really where all of these foundations are, and any sort of misconceptions that we may have about Muslims probably come from a childhood experience. And the same goes for any sort of race, or any sort of language, or any sort of ethnicity. It really comes from our childhood. And so, uh, you know, chance had it, fate had it, that um, I met with uh, the founder, may, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, Brother Dawood Tawhidi, of a school that's in Canton. That's where I came from. Sorry for running late. It took me an hour to get here. Um, called Crescent Academy International. And when I, when I visited the school and I saw their approach to education, they don't use textbooks, they don't believe in textbooks or subjects, it's not interdisciplinary, it's transdisciplinary, and it still, it, it tries to take uh, Islamic values and try to uh, teach students Islamic values so that they can become global citizens that serve their communities. This is the vision of the whole school. It just really interested me, and so I started to learn more about the school, I applied, and I got a job there, you know, thank God, so I, I just finished my first year there. And I'm working with their Arabic program. I really love languages, and uh, especially Arabic. It's my favorite language. It's complex grammar, and really interesting, and really deep. And so, um, working there, I can see a lot of a lot of the things that that I experienced in my childhood. One thing is identity. Um, this identity crisis, because uh, sometimes I would be in school, and this happened very rarely. I mean, I, I you know I thank God that. I went to school around here because I, I think that there's a lot of open-mindedness. I know in Andover, I think we had uh, people from over 60 different countries, backgrounds, and we were all together and there were different religions and we would speak openly. Rarely would you get a few people who would make some comments you know, about terrorism and try to bring up political issues that are distant from us that aren't worth arguing about because we're neighbors here after all. Um, but generally speaking, there was open-mindedness, yet still there was this, this idea of, you know, can you be American and can you be a Muslim at the same time? And, and, and perhaps it was more of a struggle for me because my parents were immigrants and so coming from, you know, the, you know this whole idea of go back to your country, how it, how it sometimes is still said nowadays, it really hit me more than others, even though like I told you, I later found out that my great, great grandmother came here, but that didn't matter. And uh, what made it even more difficult is when I went to Egypt, my, my struggle fitting in is I would tell them, hey, I, I'm American, and then they just laugh and they go, like, you're American. You don't have blonde hair, you don't have blue eyes, and you're not really white, so you can't be American. <laughs> and I went to Syria as well, and I told them I'm American, and I even had a passport, and they just laughed. They just laughed in my face, and they told me, you're not American, you're Syrian. It doesn't matter what you're sitting, it does, this is just a piece of paper. And so, even though in some parts of the world these things like citizenship and license, all these legal documents, they mean something. Um, in other parts of the world where your great-great-grandparents come from, or what tribe you're from, depending on the part, uh, still matter. Um, and, you know, in, in sharing this, I, I want to say that, again, education I, is what brought my family here in the first place. Um, it's what I realized even brought us to this town where we ended up settling down, my family still is here. Um, and it's my passion in life. And I'm really, really happy 
that you all have come out here to learn more about Muslims, to learn more about our experiences, and to, as Zarina said, to ask those questions, those burning topics, or maybe some things that are just wandering. Because if we don't have these open dialogues, if we're not willing to sit down and just say, just put, you know, put everything on the table and talk about these things openly, then what happens is we just leave things inside. And uh, you know what we say in Islam, Islam is we say you know Satan comes and he starts to whisper things and uh, it could happen where let's say for example uh, Rahim and I we maybe argue a little bit and we don't talk for three days I start to think wow maybe he meant this and maybe he meant even more and and things issues start to get bigger and so just in our person as in our uh, interpersonal relationships. Just as in our interpersonal relationships we realize that without talking, matters get worse and we start to think more of something that's smaller, uh, we should do that in our community relations as well. And so I'm really happy to be a part of this opportunity to do that. Thank you. I just want to thank all the panelists uh, for those very uh, great comments and very personal comments. Uh, and right now we just wanted to kind of open up the floor, um, like we said, like Tamam just said just kind of get things out in the open. I think we all had some introductions earlier, so we should be somewhat more comfortable. Um, and right now is just a very uh, time where you, if you have any questions uh, for the panelists, um, I may interject some questions if that's needed, but really I just want to hear from you all. Um, Would you introduce yourself and your background? Yeah, um, sure. I briefly kind of did that, but I didn't go into much detail as everyone else. Um, my name is Rahim Hanifa. I'm the outreach coordinator for CARE Michigan. Uh, which is the Council on American Islamic Relations, and um, our organization, in conjunction with the Muslim Unity Center of Bloomfield Hills, um, had the idea to organize this presentation um, to create, create dialogue. Um, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, on the east side of Detroit, um, off of Harper and Whittier area. Um, my parents converted to Islam in, uh, I believe, the early 70s. Um, they converted to Islam, and. Um, my dad uh, is an IT manager for Ford, and my mother um, is a home care uh, worker. And um, I have four siblings. One of my older siblings passed away um, some time ago. And uh, again, I went to college at Michigan State University, studied political science and sociology. Um, I actually went to college with Tamem uh, over there at Michigan State. And I uh, graduated in 08 and um, began working in different nonprofit um, organizations. And I'll be finishing up my time at CURE this summer and going back to school um, doing my master's in public policy. So that's kind of my story in a quick minute. Um, if there's any. Several of you made comments of the fact that you are converts or your parents were converts to Islam. And from time to time we hear of um, problems arising overseas in Islamic countries when someone converts from Islam to another faith. Uh, would you comment on the, the dynamic of um, interfaith conversion? and uh, the degree to which uh, it is problematic in, in some countries where Islam is the dominant religion. Yeah, I mean, um, I wouldn't say that I'm able to comment on all the countries. Um, I can tell you that um, it came up in Egypt. One of my professors for actually Egyptian colloquial Arabic, very, very nice man, is a Coptic Christian. Uh, his name is uh, Imad, Ustad Imad. Ustad means teacher, but I have to say that. It, it just seems weird to just call him by his first name. And so I was really happy about that because, because we hear a lot on the news about, I'll just raise my voice, we hear a lot on the news about uh, Christians, especially in Egypt, especially in the, um, it's called Sa'id, I think it's called in Upper Egypt, where it's basically south on the Nile. There's a large, large Christian community in that part of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And even in Syria, um, I don't know the exact percentage, but I'm thinking 20%, 20 maybe 30%, they, ha they have Christians over there as well. And so we, considering I was one of, it was basically 14 students, we were sent with um, the American Councils for International Education, um, and actually the NSA's um, education, like um, 
their part with education. They funded us with IEE, with Fulbright, and so it was a big thing. We met, we went to DC, and uh, most of the people in our program weren't Muslims. Uh, and so these issues came up a lot where we had these questions, especially with a lot of the articles um, from private, because uh, I, I used to read them all, I used to keep up with them more in, in the past. You would see all these articles, and they would come out every week or so, and they would talk about a Christian converting to Islam, or a Muslim con uh, converting to Christianity in Egypt, and the problems that would arise, particularly in the family. Um, sometimes there would be killing, sometimes there would be um, a sort of disowning of that person, sometimes there would be uh, violent crimes that would be mentioned in these reports. And so we finally sat down with uh, this professor and asked him to tell us, because he actually comes from that region. He ended up moving later to Alexandria, which is where I studied. So he's from Upper Egypt, and so he knows how to speak that dialect. It's a different dialect. And we asked him, what do you think about the situation? You're a Coptic Christian, uh, Egyptian, and you're living here in this predominantly Muslim society, and what would you say about the relations? And I want to add on to your discussion um, the building of um, uh, churches, because I, I, I think it kind of goes within the same realm. Uh, when a person converts or when you build a new structure, this is kind of a propagation of that religion. It's, a, it's another symbol of that. Um, and when he ended up sitting down with us and, and discussing it with us, uh, he, he said that a lot of the problems that happen in Upper Egypt that we find where people are converting and then sometimes you have gangs fighting each other. He actually related it to the South. And I was reading, um, I know that Malcolm Gladwell is you know, criticized for sometimes taking ideas and taking them too far and not being so sound in terms of uh, sociology. But he talks about how a lot of uh, people from um, Scottish or Irish background had come to the South, and how there had been also this culture, this tribal culture that sometimes would start a conflict that would continue for many, many years afterward over a simple scuffle. And he, what he told us, he told us that, that it's, it's a very similar culture in Upper Egypt where Christians and Muslims would fight each other over things that were very small. Were there restrictions on building uh, churches? From what I heard, yes. And he even said that, that sometimes if a church were to be expanded or if it were to be built, that there were restrictions put on that by the Egyptian government. Um, I've heard of that happening as well in Saudi Arabia, where either churches are not allowed to be built or they are allowed to be built. I don't know. I don't know about the um, political situation, to be honest. Um, but what I do know about is what the teachings that I've learned you know, from my teachers and from the scholars. And um, I think the best of examples is um, when you when we discuss the Muslim state, the Muslim state, there's all this talk, right, about Sharia Allah and the Muslim state, and they're going to come, and they're going to convert everybody by the sword. And uh, uh, when, because I, I studied a little bit in the academic field, and it's really interesting that how the outlook is different. It's really different. And when discussing empires or when discussing these big states, uh, historians say that if Muslims were to really have forced conversion and banned everybody and been so strict in this way, Islam wouldn't have been expanded to the lengths that it expanded because you need a population after all. And even though Islam began as the minority, it slowly expanded uh, under the idea that is in the Quran in, in the longest chapter, which has la ikraha fi din, which means there's no compulsion in religion. You cannot force anybody to convert. You cannot force anybody to become that religion. And so, uh, when one scholar, and his name escapes me, I, I believe it was Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah, was asked about the uh, Zoroastrians um, because Islam expanded to the Sasanid Empire, to the Persians, uh, who had this act, I'm sorry to say, uh, I, I mean, I'm sorry if it's inappropriate, but it, it is a religious act, and I asked another professor about it, and he said it's true, where basically amongst each other, amongst the, the, the priestly family and the royal family that incest was practiced to sort of preserve the blood. And it even happened with some of the royal families in, in Europe as well. Uh, when he was asked about this, and the Muslim state was asked about this, I mean, in Islam, incest is a huge crime. It's, it's, it's really bad. When he was asked about what should we do with these people, now we are governing them, but them in their own law, they're doing things that totally contradict Islam. He was told, Let's go with the Islamic law. And what is Islamic law? 
that you leave people to govern themselves. That similarly to how we have uh, rabbinic courts, I, I still think in New York, where people can marry according to different laws and have that private law for family, for inheritance, to have that preserved, that that would still be preserved in the Islamic State. And so um, it, it, it just uh, takes this whole idea of imposing one religion on other people and kind of flips it over. And so the traditional approach would be to, although there are some opinions that do say that if a person uh, converts away from Islam, and starts to openly, and this is in, an, in a state that is a Muslim state, that they should, be, um, they should be taken to jail, they should have the death punishment if they convert away from Islam, and they start to insult Islam, and they start to openly insult the government, that they should do that. This is a traditional opinion, and uh, you know, it's something that we can read very easily, that there is another opinion as well that says that that shouldn't happen unless it's seen as an act of treason. So similarly to how if I, as an American, for example, were to say, you know, I revoke my citizenship and I start insulting the U.S. and insulting the president and saying remarks that are violent in nature, how I would be taken to jail, and I think rightfully so, because I could be a danger to my neighbors. It was seen in that respect because um, the government itself was ruled by Muslims. And so that's, that's how I've understood it from my teachers, and I could be wrong. But if we look at the classical way, uh, the classical uh, Islamic state, like I said, um, there were Jews and Christians and different religions living amongst each other. Even if we look at the Ottoman governance, how in their millet system, their millet meaning millah, which in Arabic means community, they had uh, the heads of each religion together come together and meet in the royal court so that they could represent their own communities. So the idea is, is very pluralistic. This idea of a common law in the modern state that we have that one law fits for everyone, it, it's very new to the, to the classical idea of a Muslim state where every community, rather, would govern themselves, except in the cases where um, you go out of the private sphere to the public sphere. So when you start talking about this person murdered this person, this person came and, you know, crimes that, that don't just involve a person and their personal rights like family law, divorce, inheritance, such things, but that involve the, the government as a whole, then the government would step in. So that's my understanding based on what I've studied. If you want, if you have a follow-up question, please, please do ask. I wanted to add something as well, and that is, um, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that is that, um, and I'm not a scholar, but I would say there is Islam, but then there are Muslims, and Muslims are human beings, and human beings are flawed and human beings follow whims, and human beings interpret things with their own uh, lenses, and um, human beings um, do some things that may not necessarily even go with the religion or the tradition that they say that they follow. And Tumam um, spoke to you about the different opinions of, of that, but I would say in general, in a lot of things that come up with controversy around Islam, Typically, it usually is around some human beings doing some things that are not necessarily even Islamic. And I think there's a, con there's a difference between Muslims and Islam. There doesn't appear to be a strongly felt need on the part of official Islamic spokespersons to distance themselves. You know, um, as you would tell from the funny way I speak, I'm not native to these parts. Um, and in, in my homeland in Great Britain, uh, one of the great problems in, in British society the last 20, 30 years has been the conflict in Northern Ireland, which was presented in the media as Catholics versus Protestants. Mm -hmm. And most religious leaders in those contexts try to distance themselves from uh, those who wore the name but used that just as a flag of convenience and were really behaving in non-religious ways. And forgive me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't see many instances of official spokespersons from um, Muslim communities distancing themselves from some of the, you know, some of the atrocities that think, make the sensationalist headlines. I, think I would have to say first that was the state the statement um, until the lion writes the history books they will always glorify the hunter. And that means that you have to have 
um, your own voice and you have to have people within the media that um, that give you the opportunity to state. We like whenever something happens negatively or someone is killed in the wrong way, you have several Muslim leaders that condemn that act and speak very loudly against it, but you don't hear it. Why don't you hear it? Because who owns the media? Who controls that channel and the messages that are going out? And so very briefly, I would say that there, um, I think the perception is that Muslims are not speaking out against those atrocities and things that are happening, but all of us from our reality and the circles, inner circles, know that it's happening very loudly, but we have to be stronger in ourselves to make it be heard. Okay. And additionally, if I can add that, um, if you just go online and you Google something like Muslim con condemnations of, of acts of terror, um, you'll find lots of condemnation. Just about every um, major Islamic institution has condemned uh, consistently uh, whenever a major attack happened, especially like 9-11, like everyone, uh, all the major scholars and institutions uh, quite clearly condemn these acts and can continue to do so. But again, you know, these aren't the most uh, sensationalized stories, so it may not make the nightly news um, that, you know, the local imam or the imam of a large congregation denounces such acts, but, you know, they are there if you look for them. They're just not so easily presented. I think she, she had a question. Yeah, my question builds on your last comment. Um, so, on the really good side, I would say that um, I am intrigued by youth in my tradition, in the Episcopal tradition, who um, look at, and who have grown up in a, in a pluralistic and a, and a, uh, a global religious environment that I couldn't have imagined as a child. So I think they have that advantage over all of us. Um, but on the, on the good side, I think when they talk about um, uh, people of other faith traditions, and particularly their Muslim friends, I think they speak with great respect um, because of the, um, and I'm speaking generally here, and forgive any stereotypes that I'm making, but uh, the things that you're talking about, like praying five times a day and um, fasting, and um, which in the Christian tradition, in most of our Christian traditions, we would never begin to ask our families to um, live with that kind of fervor. And I think it's because we are part of the dominant culture. And it's, it's just, we, we live a much more casual religious experience. Um, the downside is that the older generations who didn't grow up in that pluralistic society, am I, did I say something really awful? No, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. They never sit together. Oh. Um, <laughs> who didn't grow up in that pluralistic society where maybe the extent of their interfaith experience was with their Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, when, they, when they really talk about uh, Islam, they, they, there's a lot of ignorance and there's a lot of fear. But I choose to spend my time with the young people <laughs> because I feel like, like you, I, I, I feel like I have more opportunity to sort of demythologize and to make sure that we're building foundations that are going to allow us to live peacefully. So here's my question. Most of my understanding of Islam on seminary train was either a, about history or theology. I'm pretty clear on our differences in terms of, I, I have lots more to learn, but I, I get that. But as culture, as people living in the United States with three or four different cultures, what are the, what, what do you experience as human beings that are misunderstandings that we as Christians, I as a Christian, um, have about you? So that I can understand, we can start to understand, wait, that, 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 that's not true, <laughs> you know? So what, what are the, what are the tensions and the um, injustices that you experience as a result of um, being um, a Muslim in America? Well, 
I mean, that's an interesting question because I'm a white American, right? So I'm like, your culture is not, I think it's guided, your religion puts parameters on it, but it doesn't, def your culture is what where you grow up, right? So I come up from like Cape Cod, which is, you know, the east coast of Massachusetts, and we have cocktail parties, but I have like a root beer, not a, you know, not a gin and tonic or something, right? So the, um, Yeah, culture is a tough question. I'm trying to think where things might be misunderstood. Um, could you rephrase your question? Well, like, I guess we're having this dialogue mm -hmm. to break down barriers, right? Yeah. To say, um, we want to have some open dialogue. I'm imagining that you are experiencing some misrepresentation and some oppression that you would like to open up and I